Welcome back to Public Finance in Canada. I'm Keith Akuja, and in this video, we're going to be taking a look at government revenue. So, so far, what we've looked at is we've looked at the legal framework of hey, setting up that division of authority between different levels of government, federal, provincial, local. From there, next, we moved on to evaluate the potential role for government intervention, and we looked at that with our evaluation of welfare economics. From welfare economics, we moved on to looking at a decision tool, primarily the cost-benefit analysis, that can be utilized to determine, hey, if a government intervention is warranted. From here, we began to switch gears a little bit. We jumped over to take a look at financial management regimes and different methods to control government expenditure through budgets. Now, keep in mind, this whole idea of financial management, of budgeting, is very different from the economic view that we took when we looked at welfare economics and cost-benefit analysis. So in this video, we're going to continue in the kind of that new flow, and that is to continue to look at not so much the economic side, but some other sides. Mind you, some economics is still going to work its way into here, some of the ideas or basis of taxation. And so what we're going to do here is focusing on revenues, government revenue, public revenue at the federal, provincial, and in the next video at the local level. And some will also address some of the main concerns and considerations and theories around how to collect revenue. So what are we going to get out of this video? Well, by the end of this video, you will be able to recognize and explain ways in which a fair tax system can be judged. So that is, right, how can we judge a tax system as to whether or not it's fair, whether or not it's just for, well, the majority of the citizens, the people paying the taxes there. We're also going to recognize and differentiate between revenue sources at the provincial and the federal level. We'll see the differences between these, and we'll also evaluate, hey, where do these revenue sources come from? Where do the federal revenue come from? Where does provincial revenue come from? Again, we'll leave local, we'll leave local taxation out, local revenue out, until part two, the next video. Again, just as we kind of went through in our budgeting video, for the most part, there's not much for me to add in our little drawing writing on the screen. I will be writing down some keywords. I will be writing down some kind of things as we go through. But for the most part, you're not going to be missing out on much if you just plug in a set of headphones and just following along, just listening. A uh, few things that we will talk about when we talk about income tax, when we talk about corporate tax, I will throw up what the, at least as of making this video, the current rate of taxation is, what those current tax rates look like, and the table from CRA for those. But again, that's just an aid, that's just an addition. It's not vital information that you need to visually see. So just that warning there. Okay, let's jump over, let's start the presentation, and let's start evaluating at least the theory side of our revenue, public revenue. Okay, as is hopefully clear, as we've witnessed that, hey, modern nation states, they have enormous responsibilities from providing education, health care, national defense, policing, uh, the list can go on, social services, welfare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, regulation, right? I I'm, I'm, might as well just stop at some point, right? Enormous responsibilities. So in order to effectively govern and in order to effectively provide these services, well, they need to have the ability to raise large sums of money in a regular and consistent fashion. And then you do this in order to cover these costs, right? Both the cost of governance and the cost of these social programs. This is primarily done, this is primarily done, as you could imagine, through taxation. So taxation, just writing that guy down there for us. So really what we need to evaluate is what is taxation? And what we can really get out of that is that taxation is going to have two roles. Two roles, that is two ways in which the government can use taxation to achieve two fundamentally different objectives. The primary point of this video is going to be the use of taxation to generate revenue. And using taxation to generate revenue, well, that's the revenue side of the budget, right? Last video series, we looked at the expenditure side. Well, in this case, we're going to look at the revenue side, where all the money comes from in order to pay for these services. There's another role for taxation, though. While taxation can be utilized to generate revenue for the government, it can also be utilized to influence or to change incentives. That is, as we engage in taxation, it distorts the economy, it changes prices, it changes our incentives altogether. 
And if tax policy is crafted properly, we can actually have a tax policy that's not even revenue based, but purely just to change the incentives of the people in the economy. That is a tax system that's entirely set up just to influence economic agents. So often it's not necessarily clear as to how that fits in or how we witness this in the world around us. So let's just take a second to talk about this role of taxation in influencing our incentives. And a prime example that we can evaluate for this, we'll take a look at two. But the first, the first will be the utilization of the carbon tax. The carbon tax, at least in theory, and most provinces as they've put in the carbon tax have held to this, is that the carbon tax ought to be revenue neutral. That is, it's not actually generating any revenue for the province or the federal government, depending on who puts this into place. What should happen is that all the money collected through the carbon tax then gets paid back out. It's already pre-earmarked and redistributed to green programs. So that is to either subsidize green energy, to subsidize clean and green products, or other green programs such as public transit. In doing so, really what this tax is doing is it's making these dirty goods more expensive while making these clean goods appear relatively cheaper than what they would normally be. That really gives these green products an ability to get a foothold against the more established, dirty alternatives. By doing so, it changes our incentives as consumers to go, hmm, I could buy this dirty product and pay this extra price because of the carbon tax, making it more expensive, or I could buy this clean green alternative that is about the same price, if not cheaper. And so the use of this carbon tax forces us, or rather encourages us, to shift away from dirty goods towards the clean ones. And that's the idea, right? Entirely to influence incentives. Now, even if, even if taxation policy is entirely revenue-based, it's still distortionary. It is still influencing incentives. And this can be seen, this can be seen in our income tax. With our income tax, and again, we'll talk about our income tax in a lot more detail later as we go through all the different sources of revenue for our different levels of government. But essentially, the income tax is, I mean, as most of us know, a taxation on your income. Every time you earn a dollar, the government takes some percentage off of it to our three payroll deductions through Canada Revenue Agency towards their revenues towards the government income. That is, in many ways, this income tax is an incentive not to work, or at least not to earn an extra dollar. At some point, if you earn enough money, your marginal tax rate gets higher and higher and higher, such that the amount of money you actually get to keep becomes less and less and less. So let's take a look at this. And in order to look at this, what we'll start off with is we'll start off back in the 1950s. So in the 1950s, the top marginal tax rate was about 90%. That is, for a top marginal tax rate of 90%, if you were in this, right, if you earned income high enough to be in this top marginal tax bracket, every extra dollar you earned, 90 cents of that went to the government. That is, if you earned an extra dollar, you only got to keep, you only got to keep 10 cents. That, uh, that wouldn't really make you too happy. That is, you wouldn't really have an incentive to continue to earn more money, more income after this point. You hardly get to keep any of it. Essentially, you're just earning money to give to the government at this point. Okay, what has happened? Well, since the 1950s, since the 1950s, we'll just fast forward to today. Today, our top marginal tax rate our top marginal tax rate today is actually sitting at about 50%. That is almost half of what it used to be. That is now, at this top marginal tax rate of about 50%, if you earn one extra dollar, well, government, our government, they're going to get 50 cents, and you, well, you're going to get 50 cents. You're going to split it more or less evenly between the government. And it's not an exact 50% marginal tax rate, but it's pretty close that it makes a nice, it makes a nice uh, demonstration here. In relation to the 1950s, well, hey, you are going to be much happier. 
if you're in this top marginal tax bracket because you're going to get to keep a substantial more amount of your income. That is, you're not going to be disincentivized to continue to work, right? At this point here, you earn an extra dollar, you still get to keep half of it. So yeah, you're going to keep earning money. You're going to say, yeah, I lose a little bit, but that's just, that's fair. I'm going to continue to earn more and more and more money. Great, right? The idea in this is, hey, if we cut this top marginal tax rate, the rich can continue to have an incentive to earn more. This incentive for them to earn more means that they take bigger, riskier business moves. This provides more jobs. This provides more innovation. This provides more investment in the economy. These are all ideally good things. Uh, this is kind of our idea behind trickle-down economics. Uh, we'll get to it. Turns out that it might be more of a political ideology than an economic ideology. That is, maybe this whole idea, this notion of trickle-down economics <laughs> might be just more of a vocal minority making a loud scene in order to get what they want. Uh, there might be actually very little proof to show that it even works. Well, we'll talk about that shortly. Turns out that, again, we'll talk about there's some criticism with it, but there is a theory that goes that the reason we have had our executive and CEO, I mean, if you've been kind of taking a look at our historical pay for executives and CEOs, you would have noticed that in the last 50 to 70 years, executive CEO compensation has exploded. At the same time, your wages for most wage earners have, for the most part, plateaued. There's been very little, if any, real increase in actual wages over this last 50, 70 years. What's going on here? Well, again, a theory, and yet to be very definitively proven, but a theory to explain why, at least jointly explain part of this, is exactly this change in taxation policy. In the 50s, executives really didn't have much incentive to continue to earn extra money. They were already earning the most that they could. Any extra money they earned just went to the government. So, hey, why bother? Might as well throw this money back into the company or back into the workers and give it there because it didn't do them any good to get it. Fast forward towards today as your top marginal tax brackets drop. Well, as your top marginal tax brackets drop closer down to this 50%, well, now there's more incentive to earn more money if you're at the top. So now if you have more incentive at the top to earn more money, you don't want to give it back to the business. You don't want to give it back to the workers. You want it for yourself because you can get the benefit from it. And so thus lies in the argument that arguably this falling top marginal tax rate has actually led to partly there's a massive rise in executive pay and partly this plateauing of median middle income wages. Again, how concrete is this theory? That's not, it's not too concrete, right? There's very little empirical evidence to really definitively show that this is the case. But from a theoretical standpoint, eh, theoretically, it does seem to be a compelling argument. So more work to be done on it, of course, but an interesting, an interesting aside, at least from my point, at least. Uh, this does really tie in nicely for us, though, into a discussion of just or fair taxation and our beginning of an analysis to kind of figure out, well, what do we mean by a just or fair tax system? So typically, the way that we would determine the fairness or the justness of a tax regime is going to depend on its level of horizontal and vertical equity. Let's define each of these. Let's talk about what they mean. Starting off, horizontal equity. What horizontal equity is getting at is that everybody who earns the same amount of money is going to pay the same amount in taxation, at least roughly so. So imagine if I earned 20,000 a year and you earned 20,000 a year, ideally we would both pay the same amount of money in taxes. And right, approximately the same amount of money depending on those income sources, maybe it'll be a little bit different, but ideally that, hey, if we earn the same amount of income, we should both pay, we should both contribute to the public offer roughly the same amount. 
compare and contrast this with our vertical equity, where the idea with vertical equity is that your tax burden should be respective to your ability to pay. Typically, if you have more income, you should face higher levels of taxation. And not just in more money being paid, but a, more, a higher proportion, a higher percentage of your income going towards that. So in this example here, if again, I earned 20,000 and you earned, I will say that you earn 120,000, well then I should give some amount of money to the government in taxes, but you should give a greater amount because you have a greater ability to pay. And so in this case here, the more you're billing to pay, the higher your income, the more that you should be paying in taxes. I want to kind of put in a little caveat here, a little side note. There has been this recent push to reevaluate vertical equity, not just based off of your incomes to say, hey, higher incomes, higher taxes, but to kind of realize that, hey, a lot of the elite, a lot of the really uh, high net worth individuals out there, these billionaires, they've really learned to play the system to have really low incomes. And because they have really low incomes, they end up throwing themselves down at this low level and pay very little taxes while they have massive amounts of wealth. So there's been a look to reevaluate this notion of vertical equity, not to be just in terms of income, but also to be terms of wealth. That is your ability to pay across all sources, not just your ability to pay based off of income. We'll see as we go through that it turns out a wealth tax can be quite regressive and using a wealth tax can actually be quite controversial in that case. But again, that's something that we'll take a look at as we carry on. Now, I threw in a word there, I've actually used it a few times already, is this notion of regressive. Well, what we can look at is along our vertical equity, we can kind of determine our degree of vertical equity. And again, our focus here on vertical equity from an income side of things. Uh, we can kind of classify this based off of whether or not our taxation system is progressive, proportional, or regressive. And let's talk about what each of these mean. Starting off with the first one there, progressive. What is a progressive taxation system? Well, a progressive taxation system is one where a higher percent of your income goes to taxes if you make more money. So the higher your income, the higher the percentage of your income goes towards taxes. That is right, the more your ability to pay, the more you should pay as a proportion of your total. Okay, next one is going to be proportional. A proportional tax is a situation such that everybody, irregardless of their income, irregardless if they make 200000 or 2000 they all pay the same percent in tax. That is, everybody pays a 10% tax. So, hey, that person who pays, who has, sorry, the person who earns $200,000, well, 10% of 200,000 is still 20 grand. They're going to pay a lot more tax than the person who made $2,000 and is only paying $200. So right in that case there, you earn more money, you pay more taxes, but it's strictly proportional. You just pay more money, your rate of taxation, that percentage amount is constant. Everybody pays 10%, for example. Compare and contrast that with progressive, where, hey, you earn a low income, you might pay only a very low percentage, if anything, in taxation. As your income goes up, the percentage of your income that you pay in taxes also increases. Finally, last one, so we looked at progressive, we looked at proportional, we have regressive. A regressive tax structure, a regressive tax regime is just the opposite of a progressive. In this case here with a regressive regime, those with lower incomes actually pay a higher percentage of their incomes towards taxation. Those with higher incomes pay less as a percentage towards taxation. So imagine somebody paying, sorry, sorry somebody earning 20 grand a year in income, paying a 50% tax, while somebody earning 200 grand a year only paying a 10% tax that would be very regressive in nature, right? You're disproportionately taking more 
a larger percentage of income away from those at the lower end of the scale than those at the top end of the scale. Very regressive. This would not be this would not be good from a vertical equity perspective. Progressive would be the best from a vertical equity perspective. And then as we move down, we're getting worse in, with respect to vertical equity. Okay, how do we stack up in Canada? Well, we can take a look at our degrees of vertical equity. So whether we're progressive, proportional, or regressive at the federal, provincial, and local levels and kind of see where each one fits. So starting off at the federal level. Well, at the federal level, we are progressive up to about the median income level. So median, just to remind ourselves what that term means, median is that half are bigger than that value, half are smaller than that value. So in this case here, we're progressive up until about that 50th percentile. So up until that point where 50% of people earn more, at which point we become more or less proportional. We do introduce again a little slight bit of progressivity once you hit the top 1%, but really for that top 49%, we're more or less a proportional system. So again, kind of a check against us for vertical equity as we move down towards that proportional case for that top 49%. Provincially, provincially we are predominantly proportional. Uh, some provinces more than others. So for example, historically Alberta had strictly a provincial proportional tax. Regardless of your income, you paid the same flat percent in taxation. Some provinces, though, are a bit more progressive than others. Uh, BC, for example, has a much many more tax brackets that is far more progressive than the federal level on whole. Going down to the local level, well, at the local level, we're actually quite regressive. That is, it's quite possible at the local level for those at lower incomes to pay a higher proportion of their taxes sorry, a higher proportion of their income to taxes. So not ideal in that case. The local level really loses out in the terms of vertical equity. Let's kind of, we have this idea of an ideal tax system has both horizontal and vertical equity. Let's uh, go and take a look at kind of what a policymaker would need to think through, what concerns they would need to weigh in order to come up with an ideal taxation system. So three big concerns that need to be addressed for an ideal tax system. The first one being revenue concerns. That is, hey, how much money do we need? Going back to our previous chapter, back to that previous series of videos, looking at our budgeting side, our expenditure side, going, okay, hey, what services do we want to provide? How much is this going to cost us? How much money do we need? Once we know how much money we need, we can discern, okay, how much revenue we're going to collect. Keep in mind, the public uh, governments don't want to collect too much revenue because, hey, that's just placing an unfair burden on their citizens. So can't just go blanket raising money, just taxing just because there needs to be some idea behind it as to where this money is going. And that is to address these revenue concerns. Beyond the revenue concerns of, okay, what are we going to spend the money on? How much money do we need to expend on X, Y, Z? is going to be concerns of equity. So horizontal and vertical equity, that is, is it fair? Are we taxing the right people? How much do we tax the top? How much do we tax the bottom? Which forms of taxation do we use? And again, something we'll look at as we go on. These concerns of equity are vitally important in determining an ideal tax system. Again, with the ideal being one that maintains horizontal equity, and one which really maintains a level of vertical equity, at least an acceptable amount of vertical equity. Keeping in mind, right, we all tell ourselves a narrative to accept a degree of inequality in society around us. And this fiscal policy, this use of tax system, really is part of that narrative. Finally, three economic concerns. And that is, how will this tax system, how will this tax regime, how will it change the incentives? the incentives to earn money, the incentives to spend money. All of this is going to have distortionary impacts on markets and the economy around us, and we need to be mindful of these economic concerns when designing a tax system. For example, if we were to decide to start charging more for income from taxable, uh, from income from capital gains, sorry, 
cat's got my tongue. So capital gains, that is you own a bunch of stocks, you own a bunch of bonds, and they appreciate in value. As this capital, as these investments appreciate in value, it used to be $5 a bond, uh, $5 a bond, the bond market's had a huge rally, and now every bond you own is now worth $15 a bond. Well, you've just made capital gains of $10 a bond as those bond prices have risen from 5 to 15 This is taxable income. Now, capital gains are taxed at one of the lowest rates of any form of income, but it's still a form of taxable income. Now, what if the government were to decide to increase taxes on capital gains? Well, why might this be a concern? Well, this might be a concern because financial capital is really global. Your savers, your investors, they could put this money anywhere in the world that they wanted. They could invest it here in Canada. They could invest it in the United States. They could invest it in Europe, China, India, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What ends up happening then is if Canada were to raise the rate of taxation on capital gains, all of these investors would just go somewhere else. They would say, hey, great. I'm just going to go save my money in the U.S. instead. I'm going to save it in Europe instead, somewhere else instead somewhere that has a better rate of taxation on my return on investment. Problem with that? Well, you end up getting capital flight. We don't want capital flight, so we don't change our rates of taxation. And as a result, what we end up getting is this so-called race to the bottom. That is to have right, the lowest level of taxation in order to prevent the capital from leaving. How true is this? Well, it depends on what we're talking about as well as where we're talking about. For example, here in Canada, yes, we see a bit of capital flight. I mean, financial capital, financial capital is flighting, right? Very easy to move financial capital from one country to another, from one region to another. But what about, say, taxation on high levels of income, right? If all of a sudden we raise the rate of taxation on the highest levels of income, are we all of a sudden going to witness all the wealthy people leave Canada? Well, maybe. Those with wealth are more able to move freely around the world due to being able to overcome that relative fixed cost of movement. But here in Canada, right, if you want to stay relatively local, you can be here or you can be the U.S. So you might see a little bit of movement across, but for one reason or another, you might prefer Canada over the U.S. socially, environmentally, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So not as big of a concern from the income side. Europe, on the other hand, Europe, on the other hand, does see this quite a bit. And as a result, they see this true race to the bottom for income taxes. That is, hey, you start to tax your wealthy too much. Well, with so many countries being so close together and with free movement of any citizen of the Eurozone, it's very easy to all of a sudden leave Germany and settle in France, leave France, settle in Switzerland, on and on and on based off of well, which country has the best taxation policy for you? In this case here, we have a true race to the bottom in terms of both taxes on capital as well as taxes on income due to this free movement of goods, services, people, and capital. So, yes, globalization has been a good thing for many reasons. Uh, it's been problematic in setting taxation systems because of these economic concerns. As a result, yes, we have this race to the bottom. Yes, we have this theory being proposed of, hey, let the rich have more of their money by letting them have more of their money, more of that money they use to invest, to create jobs, to innovate, and all of this. This is our notion. This is our guise of trickle-down economics. Unfortunately, by far and large, trickle-down economics is just bad economics. That is really, this is a politically motivated argument with very weak, if any, actual economic rationale supporting it. So a little bit problematic there. Um, as a bit of an aside, you can kind of uh, tie into this a bit of Murphy's Law of Economics. I mean, we've all heard of Murphy's Law, right? To kind of take a bit of a fun spin on this, look at it from an economic side point, we can say that underneath Murphy's Law of Economics, policies in which economists are most in agreement, these are the policies that are rarely enacted. Whereas the flip side, policies that have the least consensus, 
that have the most controversy, these are the policies that are most often adopted. So, ah, problematic there, right? Problematic there. And that is most economists across the board, fairly clear consensus that trickle-down economics does not work. If anything, there's a stronger case for this idea of trickle-up economics. And if you give money to those at the bottom, that money will flow up through the economy and have a much stronger effect. Okay, all of that, taking a look at ideal tax systems, looking at notions of a just tax system, a fair tax system, let's take a look at where our federal, where our provincial government actually gets their revenues from. Okay, so starting off with our federal government and evaluating the sources of funds for the federal government, to start off, we have our income tax. The income tax is collected by the Canada Revenue Agency, and it accounts for just over 50% of federal government revenues. It's collected from all sources of income. So we've already alluded to this, your actual payroll income, your capital gains income, your rental income, all sources of income are subject to the income tax, except for some notable exclusions. I uh, can't go through all the exclusions, but some of the big notable ones would be any capital gains from the sale of your home. So we took a look at capital gains already from investment instruments. Your home is exempt from capital gains tax. Gifts, lottery winnings, these are also exempt from an income tax. Any disability insurance or any other insurance that you get paid out is, again, exempt, as well as any strike pay you might receive. The federal income tax is a progressive income tax. That is, you pay a higher marginal rate the more money you earn. And let's take a look at the rates for, well, the federal level. What do we see? Well, we see that up to 50197 you pay a 15% tax rate. For the next $50,195, you pay 20.5. Again, as you earn more and more, you end up paying a higher and higher proportion of your income in taxes. So between 100 and 155, you pay 26%, 155 to 221, 29%. And if you earn more than 221,000, you pay 33%. Okay, let's take a look at a common, a common myth that exists out there which is this whole notion that, hey, if you earn more money, if you get a raise, that's, let's say you get just a little bit of a raise that bumps you over $100,392 into that next tax bracket, right? There's this whole argument, hey, if you get a raise, you can actually take home less money. And that's completely false. These tax brackets are set up, these are marginal tax brackets, such that you are only taxed this higher rate on the extra dollar you earn in that bracket. So let's evaluate this with an example. Let's suppose you earn, and I think we use this amount already, $120,000. Let's take a look at your federal tax breakdown for this $120,000 worth of income. So, okay, to start off, you would have your first $50,197. 50,197 dollars taxed at 15 percent. So taxed at 15 percent, 0.15, meaning that you would be paying on that, uh, what does that work out to? 7,529 and 55 cents. Okay, so that's what you pay from that first bit. Then, okay, we still have a little bit of money left over. You're not, you're earning a lot more than 50,197. So we look at our next tax bracket, which is 50,197 up to 100,392. Well, okay, you're earning 120, so you're earning that entire tax bracket and then some. So, hey, this tax bracket here, that is 50,195. And this entire tax bracket is being taxed at 20.5%. So times 0 0.205, 20.5%. Meaning, hey, on that next 50,000, you're paying a total of $10,195. And, oh, sorry, looking at the wrong part of my calculator, 10,289. 
10,289.98. Okay, so that brings us all the way up to this $100,392 that we've been taxed on so far. So what do we have left over? We have from this $100,392 all the way up to our $120,000 that we earn. So that is that last little bit of money, that last $19,600, $19,608 to be exact, that is going to be taxed at this 26% tax rate, so 0 0.26, at a total of $5,098. And how many cents do we have? We have 8 cents. So... That last bit, 5,098.08, oh, giving us a total for our total taxes paid. Add all those up, and we get 22,917. And how many cents there? 61 cents. So, hey, 22,917.61, what does that work out to? Well, 22,917 and 61 cents all over our total income of 120,000. That's actually only a tax of 19%, meaning we're only really paying 19% of our total income in taxation. These different bits here, right? 20.5, 26%. Well, that's our marginal tax rate. We just kind of get this weighted average as we move through. As we go through this, if I were to earn plus $1, that is if I were to go from 120,000 to 120,000 and $1, well, how much would my tax increase by? Well, out of this extra dollar of income, I would lose 26 cents of it to the government. I would get to keep the extra 74 cents, right? In this case here, every dollar that I earn as extra income gets taxed at this marginal rate until I hit the next tax bracket. And then every extra dollar would get charged at this extra higher tax rate. All the previous dollars, though, all the previous dollars get charged at their previous tax rates. So it's not like your entire tax regime jumps up. It's only the taxation rate on the extra dollars. So big fable that exists, right? Big urban legend that, hey, it is possible to get a raise and to take home less money. Not true with this marginal tax rate. Okay, let's go jump over to corporate taxes. To jump right into it, our corporate taxes are more or less proportional. Proportional, sorry. So very different than personal. There is a slight degree of progressivity in it, but predominantly it's just a proportional tax. That slight degree of progressivity comes in right here. That is, if we presume just entirely revenue earned in Canada, we see that small businesses, that is businesses with less than half a million in taxable income, they get taxed at one rate, where all the other businesses, they get taxed at another. So that is small businesses, they get taxed at a flat 10.5%, where if you earn over a million dollars, you get taxed at 28%. Any general income you earn outside of Canada, well, that revenue gets taxed at an even higher rate of 38%. So we see there it's more or less proportional, and not a lot more to say about that. Carrying on then, uh, sorry, we can also say about the corporate tax. I don't know if I mentioned it all or not. While our personal income tax accounted for 55.0% of total revenues, the corporate accounted for 15, 1.5% of all revenues. Jumping then next to GST, our goods and services tax, this guy, this guy accounts for just over 11% of all federal revenues. Now, a bit of background, a bit of history on the GST. It has uh, GST, our goods and services tax. It replaced the federal sales tax, the FST, back in 1991. This was done in order to align our taxation with our new adoption of NAFTA. And we now have our GST, which is by far and large, well, not by far and large, GST is a proportional tax. That is, it doesn't matter if you earn a million dollars a year or if you earn a hundred dollars a year. You pay the same 5% tax on every goods, every good and service you buy. So strictly proportional, irrespective of your income. 
So there we go, proportional tax. Again, kind of a hit against our vertical equity in that case there. Now the intent when we adopted GST in 91 was actually to move towards HST, a harmonized sales tax, in order to ease in the collection and administration. That is to kind of merge together the GST at the federal level and the PST at the provincial level into one HST. That way there, we're not doing the double counting of the federal government doing it for GST, the provincial government doing it for PST. It was just one system, HST, within the amounts being paid out to the provinces. To date, only the Atlantic provinces have adopted HST. Here in BC, we had a brief foray into it until we decided that we didn't want it anymore. And so we repealed it and paid a whole bunch of money to repeal it and went back to GST and PST because we did. We won't get too much more into that here. Uh, what do we have next? After GST, we could look at our next big source being EI premiums. And EI premiums, these guys are going to count for about 7% of revenues. 7% of revenues. Now, EI premiums are proportional, if not to a degree regressive. Uh, to a degree because, well, we'll talk about it as we get through it. So how does this work out? Well, your EI premiums, they are collected as a payroll deduction. The cost is split between you and your employer. So your, you pay half, your employer pays half, and it is based off of the assumption that you have maximum insurable earnings of 60300 a year. That is, hey, if you end up needing to collect EI, this is the maximum amount of income that they will qualify you under. If you earn more than that, that's the amount that you are insured for under EI. If you earn less than that amount, well, then you can be insured for your actual amount of income. You will then get your EI rate coming off at a rate of 1.5%. 5.8% being your maximum contribution. So 1.58% of your 60,300 is a maximum EI payment of 952.74. That's the most that you can contribute to EI a year. Again, that's you and your employer each contributing that amount, providing you a bit of a social safety net in case you become unemployed, right? You can then get back EI payments up until this maximum insurable amount. So, okay, it's proportional in that you just pay some proportion of your insurable amount to a degree if you earn more money up until this amount, you end up paying more in premiums, but just at this proportional rate, 1.58%. Once you hit your cap, right? Once you hit 60,300 worth of income and you go beyond that, you stop paying extra money into EI, right? This is the most you can be insured for. This is the most that you can be taxed for in EI payment. And so as a result, as soon as you start to earn more and more money, you stop paying anything extra to EI. In that case there, it's regressive. in the fact that if you're a high income earner, you spend less of your money as a percentage on EI premiums. If you are a low income earner, you're going to spend a higher proportion of your income on EI premiums. So regressive in that nature there. The next and final source of revenue for the federal government that we'll look at is CPP. That is the Canada Pension Plan Premiums. So, okay, in this case here, not really going to go into percent of revenues because this is earmarked for the pension plan. But again, this is coming through payroll deduction with, again, that cost being shared by the firm and employees. So again, similar to your EI situations. Again, similar to your EI situation, this is based off of a maximum pensionable earnings of $64,900. And this is going to be at a rate of 5.7%. So, right, again, your maximum pensionable earnings of 64900 that's going to be taxed at a rate of 5.7%, meaning that your maximum contribution for a given year will be $3,699.30. So, again, in this, because you're only really pensionable up to this amount here, 
up until that level. If you earn less than this amount, well, you just pay the proportional tax into your pension plan. And then as you get earning more and more and more money, eventually you get cut off. You pay your maximum amount, and then you don't contribute any more to the pension plan beyond that amount. What this really means is, again, there's a regressivity built into this, initially proportional, then moving regressive, and the fact that the higher incomes pay less proportion of their money towards CPP than the lower incomes. So again, degree of regressivity in both employment insurance premiums as well as CPP premiums. What we can say about each of these, if we kind of look at these historically, CPP premiums, well, we said these are currently 1.58%. This has actually been dropping annually. Uh, it was at a height in 1994 at 3.7%, sorry, 3.07%. And so this has been dropping, meaning from a vertical equity perspective, we've been moving in the right direction. On the flip side, CPP premiums, well, CPP premiums, this rate of 57 this has only been growing since, ince since inception. And okay, what's the rationale behind that? Well, keep in mind, when the idea of pensions was first floated, when the idea of retirement was first floated, was okay, you retired at 65, you lived your retirement, and then you died by 68 to 70. So that is really, you got this pension for three to five years. What's happening now? Well, what's happening now is you retire, you get this pension, and you are living by far and large till 80 to 90 now. That is a substantially longer period that you are now alive for drawing on this pension. This whole time you now have this guarantee that you will continue to receive this pension until death. So what was initially a three to five year commitment is now a up to 25 plus year commitment. So significantly longer, significantly larger burden to those of us still paying into the pension plan. Hopefully, hopefully it's still there when we need it. If not, well, hopefully self-funded, self-funded retirement sounds okay. Okay, as promised, that's the end of our taxation or that side of revenue sources. There is another big revenue source for us to consider, however, and that final revenue source is our debt financing. Uh, debt financing. So what's going on with debt financing? Well, rarely do revenues equal expenses, right? I know that doesn't mean, hey, revenues don't equal expenses, therefore debt. No, 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 no. If we have more revenue than expense, well, hey, that's a surplus. We brought in more money than we're spending. That surplus, that's a savings, or those savings can be got, used to pay down existing debt. The alternative is also true. If our revenues are less than our expenditures, well, if our revenues are less than expenditures, we have a deficit. A deficit, well, that means we don't have enough money to pay all of our obligations. We need to borrow in order to finance those obligations. And by borrowing, our deficit is adding to our debt. Uh, to take a look back in 2020, the federal government, right? That's who we're looking at here, federal government. They had a deficit of $28.8 billion. Primarily, primarily, this is owing to the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic and the massive relief efforts that went throughout, right? Massive amounts of expenditure, cutting back on their revenue to let people keep their money, all of this ballooned into a massive deficit. One of the big things to keep in mind is that debt does not equal deficit, right? A deficit is a flow. A deficit is how much we are adding, how much we're borrowing in a given period. Debt is, well, how much is outstanding altogether. So for example, presuming I started at zero, I had no debt, I had no savings. If in a given month, I needed to spend $100 more than I made. Well, in that month, I ran a $100 deficit. That $100 deficit would then become a $100 debt. In the next month, if again I overspent, and this time I overspent by $50, well, in that next month, I ran a $50 deficit. 
my debt, my debt now becomes $150, right? My deficit is just added to my debt. Throw that back on in my third month, say I ran a surplus, that is I cut my spending back, I made more money than I spent, I ran a surplus of say $40, well that $40 surplus pays off some of my debt, my debt was, was $150, I moved $40 surplus into my debt, I now only have a debt of $110. So again, that surplus, that deficit is the change in debt, what we're either adding or taking away from it. How does the federal government's debt look? Well, government, federal government's debt in billions of dollars. We have our unmatured debt, that's uh, $783.8 billion. We have public sector pension liabilities and other employment benefits. That's about $295 billion. And then we have other liabilities altogether for $6.1 billion, giving us about $1,084.8 billion worth of public debt. Again, a bit of an aside to talk about debt, and what often isn't brought up with this is that really how debt fits into our whole notions of vertical equity. And that is often, it really doesn't seem that debt fits into vertical equity. We have all of this taxation from all these different sources, and then debt, and it seems like, hey, debt's just a burden that falls on everybody. But it's been argued that that's not actually true. It's been argued that the rise of debt financing is really linked to the drop in taxation of top income earners. By doing so, what has essentially happened is, okay, we've lost tax revenue from taxing the top and we've needed to still provide all these services. So we've shifted towards debt financing. So, hey, government issues debt. Who ends up primarily buying this debt? Well, those top income earners who no longer are paying the high taxes. That is, they're still contributing to government, but instead of paying it in taxes, they're now just buying the bonds, buying the government debt. In this way here, the service still gets provided, right? That public benefit still gets had, and those at the top still get to receive that public benefit. But what they also get to receive is the return on investment. They also get to receive any capital gains from those bonds. They also get to receive their interest payment from lending that money to the government. In this case here, what we've essentially done is we've taken the bottom half, the bottom plus half of our taxpayer distribution, and we use their taxpayer money to then pay the top half, not even top half, the top 1% through this whole rearrangement of debt financing. So. Again, it has been argued that this is actually a form of hidden regressivity within our taxation system, is that this adoption of mass debt financing rather than just taxation properly is actually a hidden regressivity or a hit against our vertical equity in the system. Okay, that's our federal system in a nutshell. Let's jump and take a look at the provincial system. We're going to burn through this because, well, the provincial system is really just a mirror of the federal system. Very, very similar. As we saw through the Constitution, they had differences in their ability to raise revenue, but really through different acts that have been passed or legislations or interpretations by the Supreme Court, we've essentially wound up at a very similar level. So that is our revenue sources are not exact, but similar. So starting off with the income tax, the income tax altogether at the provincial level, it's collected again by the CRA. So, hey, the federal government collects it on behalf of the provinces and then distributes it back. In BC, this accounts for about 18% of all provincial revenues. Again, as we kind of mentioned earlier, the BC provincial income tax is quite progressive. We have a lot more tax brackets existing than there is at the federal level. I don't have the table to throw in here, but you can go take a look at it. There's several more available. The corporate tax is again quite similar to what we looked at with the federal level. This accounts for about 8.5% of provincial tax revenues and is again pretty similar. It's more or less proportional with a slight degree of progressivity. Where we begin to deviate is this other tax revenue. And this other tax revenue is actually quite a large other category at 27% of tax revenues. And really it is through the type and, well, yeah, the type and the way that these other taxes are levied 
that really adds a degree of regressivity to our provincial system. Three big ones that we can look at in this other tax revenue, we have our PST, which accounts for about 12.6% of our provincial revenues, and our PST, just like the GST, is proportional. That is, irrespective of your income, you pay that same percentage on everything you buy. Beyond that, we have our tax on property. Tax on property, that is our PTT, property transfer tax, just to label one of those taxes, at about 7%. And I want to highlight, this here, this tax on property, this is different than a property tax. A property tax is collected by our municipalities, our local governments, which we'll look at in the next video. This tax on property, prime example of it is the property tra transfer tax, which is collected every time a property is bought or sold. So, hey, you buy a property. Well, as soon as that goes through the BC registry, it gets charged a tax. You sell your property as soon as that gets registered or sold through the registry office. Again, that tax is levied. So just an example of a tax on property and accounting for about 7% of revenues. Again, that's actually very regressive because it's completely irrespective of income. That tax is dependent on the value of the property, not dependent on the income. So you could imagine there's a millionaire who's buying and selling properties, paying the same tax as some little grandma who's a pensioner who has to sell her house to buy a condo paying the same property transfer tax. Last one is gonna be royalties. Oh, I switched colors there, oh well. Royalties, these royalties, these are resource royalties, so oil, gas, natural resources, fishing, forestries, all of that, we collect a royalty every time we give the right to a company to harvest those resources, and these account for about 4% of our provincial of our provincial revenue. We also have outside of other tax revenues, right? There's other ones in here, that's why we don't add up to exactly 27%, but these are the big three. Outside of our other tax revenues though, we have just our other revenues. And these are from non-tax sources. So what exactly are these other revenues that are non-tax sources? Well, again, to look at some of the big ones, we have transfers. These are primarily grants from the federal government. So the federal government giving the provinces money. So in BC, this accounts for about 16% of our revenues. And these are block transfers, unconditional transfers, and conditional transfers. The, con the unconditional ones are just, hey, here's a bunch of money, do with it as you will. The conditional transfers are saying, hey, BC, here's a bunch of money, you have to spend it on health care. Here's a bunch of money, you have to spend it on education. These conditional transfers allow that federal government to have influence on the provision of these services, which are predominantly a provincial authority. The provinces can always say, hey, we don't want your money, we'll do it ourselves. But if they do want the money, they have to abide by the conditions on that money. Outside of these transfers, what else do we have? We have fees for services. Uh, if you've ever heard of it, there's a great saying that BC means bring cash, right? And we see that in really every access to government services from getting a driver's license to writing your driver's test to anything dealing with the government, you have to pay a user fee, a service fee. These all together, all these service fees, they actually account for about 18% of government revenue. So a sizable amount. Again, you can imagine that these service fees, they're quite regressive in nature. If you are on the upper end of the income scale, well, these fees aren't going to be a large proportion of your income. They're going to be eh, marginal at best. At the lower end of the income distribution, however, these fees can be quite substantial, and thus they can make up a large proportion of your income. So these are regressive in nature in that sense there. Finally, Finally, from other revenues is we have surpluses from crown corporations. And what do we mean by that? Well, these are going to be things like ICBC, BC Ferries, BC Hydro, right? Just to name a few examples. These are publicly owned companies that have a charter to operate. Sometimes these companies can run profits and these profits or these surpluses they can then be rolled over into government, provincial government revenues. 
Altogether, these surpluses, they typically account for 5%. Finally, finally to wrap ourselves up, other than these other revenues, is again, we can have debt financing. Just like the federal government, the provincial government's free to borrow as they please. What we can do, though, at the provincial level is really break it down into two subgroups. First subgroup is taxpayer-supported debt and self-supported debt. What's, what's the difference here? Well, taxpayer-supported debt, this is debt taken by the provincial government itself. Taken by the provincial government itself to provide just our public services, and this debt is going to ultimately be repaid through taxes. Self-supported debt, in contrast, well, in this case, this comes from our self-supported crown corporations, such as, I don't know, BC Ferries. And in the case of BC Ferries, let's say they need to buy a new boat. Well, they go and they take out a massive loan to buy a new boat. This loan, this debt is entirely going to be self-serviced by BC Ferries. That is, it'll be financed through fair traffic, through ticket sales and all of that. It's not going to fall on the taxpayer. Now it does still fall in here underneath our looking at provincial debt because as a crown corporation, as a subsidiary of the province, if BC Ferries does default on their debt, unable to make payment to their debt, well, it will ultimately fall on the taxpayer, but it is self-supported until that time. That is hopefully BC Ferries or any of our other big crown corporations ever get to this point of insolvency. Wouldn't be so good. Okay, so that was a whirlwind. Really wanted to burn through our federal and provincial levels of revenue. Um, primarily because just a whole bunch of fire hose information. Not really, I don't know, in my mind, too interesting. There's some interesting things there. Like, wow, that's a lot of money that the province makes from fees from services. Outside of that, though, big kind of idea is the regressivity, progressivity, proportionality of the tax system. Our theories for creating an ideal tax system and the like. So, okay, kind of gave a brief summary there, but what have we looked at all together? We started off by kind of telling the story as to our basis for the need for government revenue, right? To be able to provide the basis of taxation and with some key considerations that policymakers need to consider in order to adopt a change in tax policy. Hey, why should we increase? Why should we decrease? From there, we moved into looking at the key sources of revenue at the federal and provincial levels. And that's what we just finished off taking a look at. In the next video, the next video is going to be focused strictly on local levels of government and sources of revenue at that local le level. Big thing here is we're going to recognize the key differences and the key differences in the ability for local governments to raise tax revenue. If you have any questions on this video, please feel free to reach out. Please feel free to comment below, post on the D2L discussion board, or of course, please feel free to send me an email. Thanks. Until next time.